All right, go ahead and take your seats, and uh, we're going to be getting into God's Word, Revelation chapter 12, and so you can be uh, turning to uh, that passage in your Bibles, Revelation 12, and uh, thanks, Sean, uh, for that. Perfect, thank you. Revelation 12. Well, uh, Remembrance Day was uh, just uh, nine days ago, and I had the uh, privilege, like many of you, to get out to uh, one of the services, and I was uh, downtown Barrie um, at the ceremony that was taking place uh, there, and as part of the ceremony, they were introducing the uh, oldest of the veterans, uh, World War II veterans now, uh, three or four of them that were all um, over 100 years old and had served uh, in one of the services during World War II. And I was reminded again, <clears throat> having watched that, being at the ceremony and, and seen uh, these men, that there was a generation in Canada that knew what it was like to be at war. And that's something that we have not really been able to understand. There's a generation that understood what it meant to send our young to fight, a generation that understood what it meant to have rationing at home, to have curfews, uh, to face the uncertainty of this despotic regime that was intent on world domination. And it's because of that generation and also because of the providence of God, His kindness toward us, that subsequent generations for, it's almost mind-boggling, but subsequent generations for 80 years now, eight decades, have not experienced what that generation experienced. Notwithstanding the fact, I understand we're a, a country with many immigrants from other parts of the world and maybe uh, you might have come to this country having experienced warfare in your own country, but notwithstanding that, in the, in the main experience of this country that you've come to, uh, we have not experienced wartime in that way as it was experienced in the world wars for 80 years. This prolonged period of peace and prosperity has made it difficult for us as Christians to grasp what the biblical authors were talking about when they spoke of spiritual warfare. How could we possibly know what warfare is about? How could we possibly know the cost of warfare? How could we possibly know the sacrifice? How could we possibly understand in any way the vigilance that is required by an entire people, an entire nation, to fight a war? We're going to learn it from reading books, from watching movies, even from listening to veterans. The reality is, no, we're not. So how then, how do we grasp the, the, the warfare that we're in as Christians? Revelation 12 gives us some sense of what we're facing as believers now and what we will face in the intense circumstances of the end of the age. We get a glimpse here of this unseen spiritual war. And, and in fact, one commentator said, this is the core theme of Revelation. It's spiritual warfare. But we get a glimpse of this unseen spiritual war that's been raging between Satan and God since before time itself. It's a war that we're in today. It's a war that will culminate in the last days. And if you're a Christian, you're a player in that war. You and I are, are targets of the enemy's attacks. We're combatants who, who, ex, who are expected to wage war against this enemy. We might often see ourselves as victims in the midst of this war, when in fact we're not victims, we're victors in this war. And as this spiritual war rages, you and I need to ask the question, what are my responsibilities if I'm a combatant? What are my responsibilities as a co-combatant with Christ? And it's those responsibilities that we'll see in Revelation 12 this morning. So uh, turn in your Bibles to that passage. If you're not already there, Romans 12, I'll read the uh, Romans, Revelation 12, second service, long week, um, Revelation 12, I know where I am, Revelation 12, 1 to 17, and a great sign appeared in heaven. This is the apostle John seeing this vision. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant 
It was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, War arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood, but the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God, who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea." Do you have a feeling you just watched an episode of Lord of the Rings? After hearing that chapter, it's wild, it's wacky, it's wonderful. There's so much in this particular passage. And here's what we want to to see as we work through these verses. As, as, As spiritual war rages in the unseen realm, what are my responsibilities? Well, first this, I must keep my focus on Christ and the church. Now, John starts, you might have noticed that when I was reading through uh, the chapter that it sounds a little repetitive, and that's because in the first six verses of the chapter, you have a synopsis, and then in chapters, uh, verses 7 through 17, the rest of it, he repeats and goes over that again. The first six verses are, in essence, uh, an executive summary of the entire chapter in which he then goes into greater detail in the latter part. Now remember, the seventh trumpet is sounded in the previous chapter, chapter 11, and signs began to appear as the final battle was now approaching. We knew that the seventh trumpet is going to unleash the seven bulls, the last movement of Satan against God and against his people. The imagery in chapter 12 is super intense, and, and to be honest, in some of the details, all but impossible to interpret. If you read the various commentators and the various schools of thought, all of whom love Jesus and love the Bible, have a high view of Scripture. There's so many varied understandings of what we're seeing here in chapter 12. Almost all of them agree it's a hinge chapter in the entire book, so important to the theme of everything. What's essential for us, though, is to lock down with certainty the interpretations that are obvious to us, and then to apply those principles that come out of it. We want revelation to be transformational to our lives now. Again, we've said that, I feel like I've said this so many times, we've been going through this, we want to resist speculating on everything else in the chapter that we can't figure out. And so we're going to settle on a general sense of what's happening in the vision, and we're going to allow that to be applied into our individual lives as Christians. 
And again, you're going to see that the main thrust is to keep our focus on Christ and his church. So verse 1, the first sign is of this woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet. She's wearing this crown, 12 stars. She's pregnant, verse 2. She's crying out. She's not just pregnant. She's laboring. She's giving birth. She's crying out in birth pangs. The agony of giving birth is on her. The woman uh, is best seen, and all of the commentators would generally agree with the fact that this is the people of God. This is a picture. The woman is a picture of the people of God, of you and me. In fact, encompassing all of the people of God from all of history. We think about believers before the time of Israel, before Abraham. There were people who believed the promise that, that one would come who would, who would crush the serpent's head. And people believed that and they trusted in God. And then uh, Abraham was called and Israel was established and God worked with that nation and they believed the promise of Messiah. And the Messiah came and God shifted his focus and his attention uh, to the church. His message now being delivered through the church. But all of them, all of them, pre-Israel, Israel and church, all of them, the people of God. And this woman is an image of the people of God. All true believers in every epoch of history. Then in verse 4, we're going to move around a little bit in this chapter. In verse 4, in the latter part, you notice now the dragon. We're introduced to the woman, but now to the dragon who stood before the woman who was about to give birth. He's waiting there. He's waiting for the birth to take place. Why? So that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now you think about that. If this, this imposing dragon is ready to, to devour the child, then, then that child must be pretty important. Agreed? This isn't hard interpretation. The child must be very important. Verse 5, so she gave birth to a male child. Notice, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Now, if you're just, open up book of Revelation, you're reading through, you're here chapter 12, you're reading this, and as you're reading, because we always do this, no matter what we're reading, we're always interpreting. And if you're reading this, and you're interpreting this, and you're seeing this woman who's representing the people of God, and you're seeing this male child who's going to rule with a rod of iron, Who's the child? Interpret for me. It's Jesus. It's the Sunday school answer. It's Jesus, right? It's always Jesus. It's Jesus. The Savior is born out of the people of God. This is a picture of his incarnation, his coming to earth, his earthly ministry. And he was birthed out of the true people of God at the time, the, the nation of Israel. Well, then we fast forward. Because immediately in the same verse, the child was caught up to God and to his throne. So we get a picture of his birth. Then we get this picture of his ascension where he goes back to the throne and nothing in between that. But the author and the vision is assuming that we're going to understand that this, this is a picture of the totality of his earthly or incarnational life. And so that would include his birth, but his life and his ministry, the preaching ministry, the healing ministry that he, that he did, but then also his condemnation, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. All of that included by simply saying, he was born of the woman, and he was ascended. He ascended back to the Father. So everything is in view here. He accomplished his earthly ministry. And then in verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished. We've seen this number before, 1,260 days. This is the same time period. You're seeing it in different ways, three and a half years, 42 months, or in the very poetic time, times and half a time, all of it referring to the same period of time, whether literal or figurative. It is a relatively short period of time of intense persecution that comes at the end of the age. You could write this down. This is Satan's last hurrah. Okay, that's what this time period is. And it's when this unholy trinity of Satan, this is the devil and the dragon and the beast, when all of them make their last attempt to destroy the people of God. And in the book of Revelation, we're moving along in our timeline to that period of time that's been referred to so many times. Well, God wasn't putting up with the dragon's nonsense. So we, get, we see him, this dragon, trying to subvert the people of God, trying to harm the woman. 
And so God casts him out. Verse 13, we see that when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to earth, notice he, he, he had pursued the woman. He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So at one time, this dragon was in the heavenlies, but was cast down and went after the woman. He went after the woman because he couldn't get to the child. He couldn't get to the child, so he went after the people of God. He couldn't go after Christ himself, so he went after those who believe. This is the persecution of believers. This is the afflicting of the church. But God, verse 14 says, God protected the woman, giving her two wings of the great eagle so she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. Obviously, figurative language beautiful imagery of God's protection of the church to the place where she is to be nourished. Again, here's that time period for time and times and, and half a time. So in some fashion, here's what we can say, in some fashion, despite the fact that the dragon is attacking and is being permitted to attack the church, in some fashion, the church believers are also protected. But it's very interesting to talk about the protection of God because we know that God's version of protecting us is very different than, than the ideas that we might have at times. God does not necessarily protect us from persecution. God does not necessarily protect us from illness and from trials. And for sure, God does not protect us from death because everyone in this room is appointed to die. So God doesn't protect us from these things that we would most naturally say, God, could you protect me from that? I'd rather not go through trials. I'd rather not die. I'd rather not be sick. I'd rather not be poor. But God doesn't necessarily protect us from these things. Protected does not mean kept from persecution or even death. Osborne said this in his commentary, uh, Satan may be able to kill Christians, but he can't defeat them. Satan may be able to kill Christians, but he can't defeat them. And that gets to the heart of what Jesus is doing when he says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect the parts of you that are important. You're not going to hell. You're going to go to heaven. Your flesh may fail, but I'm going to take you into eternity. I'll give you a confident assurance in the midst of it. You can have faith in me and trust me. The flesh may fail, but I'm going to take you to be with me. And so death, death is not a defeat if you're a Christian. We all understand that. Death is not a defeat. Trials are not a defeat if you're a Christian. Persecution is not, oh, God abandoned me, and that's why these people are able to come after me. Not at all. They persecuted all of the prophets. They persecuted Christ to death. And so God's version of protection and ours is often very different, but in some fashion, the church here is being protected and in verses 15 and 16, we have this illustration of this flood, which is initiated by the serpent to swallow up the church, but then this flood is diverted by God and swallowed up by the earth. And what's striking about all of this is the dragon's obsession with the child. And again, I don't want us to get lost in all this crazy imagery and spend so much time trying to figure out what's the flood and how to get swollen up and swallowed up. And I don't know. But what I know is this, this dragon is so obsessed with the child. And when he couldn't get at the child, he turned his attention to the woman. So here's my question. As I look at this, if Satan puts all of his focus on defeating Christ and afflicting the people of God, should we not also put all of our attention on Christ to worship him and on the people of God to protect and care for them? If that's where he's putting his attention, then that's the most important thing, and that's where I need to put my attention. And what we're seeing here is a depiction of, of a spiritual war that began in ages past. This isn't anything new. And it has sub subversively influenced all of world history. It continues into our day, and it's going to culminate in this final battle where the dragon will finally be defeated, never to afflict humanity again. And that battle rages right now. And because it does, 
We need to have our eyes on Jesus. And we have to devote ourselves to a vigilant defense of the church. And how do we do that? Well, several of my, one passage, of several verses that are among my favorite in all of the New Testament is in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. And I want to walk you through these verses to help us understand a little bit more of this spiritual warfare that we're in. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, all that means, though we live physical lives, though we find ourselves in the material realm, we are not waging war according to the flesh. This isn't a battle over things that we can see. This is a battle over things that we cannot see. It's not a physical battle. For the weapons of our warfare, he says, are not of the flesh. So we're not battling even with, with visible weapons. But have divine power, these weapons have divine power to destroy strongholds, to destroy the, the, the built-in strongholds of the evil one. He goes on to say, we destroy arguments. And this is going to help us laser focus now what the battle actually looks like. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. So the battlefield, it seems, an unseen spiritual war is really a war for our minds, for our thinking. That's why the evil one is called the deceiver, because he is constantly barraging us with lies and, 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 and half-truths to influence, to pull us away from God. We're going to take every thought captive to obey Christ. The whole point of this is that we live holy lives consistent with the word of God, to obey him, being ready to punish every disobedience, not so much the disobedience of others, but please let's consider ourselves, punish our own disobedience. I don't need to worry so much about how... Uh, the fact that I'm a pastor aside and shepherding this flock, I don't need to worry so much about your Christian life as much as I just need to worry about mine. I need to punish the disobedience that's in me. My hands are full with Todd. Anyone else in the same boat here with yourself? Not with me, I got... Okay, we need to be ready to punish every disobedience when your, he says, when your obedience is complete as we, as we move toward the perfection of being with Christ and being like Christ. So the battlefield is in our minds and it's in our hearts to believe what God says rather than to believe what the deceiver says. The warfare is for our obedience to Christ and every Christian who says, that's how I intend to live, by default, by default is fusing themselves to the church and defends and protects the church. Fused to Christ, fused to the church. And so when we talk about the battle to be obedient, to live this way, to put Christ at the center, to be part of the church, the bride of Christ, it's not complicated how we fight this war. We had Pastor Daryl Dash here a few weeks ago talking about uh, eight habits for growth, and it really comes down to the simplicity of these these spiritual disciplines that we would put into our life. There's no way that you can refute the, the deceiver, you can't refute him unless you know this book. Unless you know the truth of God's word, you're not going to be able to refute what the evil one is saying to you. So the discipline of the word, are you in the word? Not just today, are you in the word yourself? Learning and growing in this. The discipline of, of worship, of being together with God's people. It's so wonderful that you've come here today, that you lifted your praises before the Lord. We need this. He made us as worshiping beings. We don't worship God. We're going to worship something else. And, and it's wonderful that you're here today. And I say to those who are on the live stream right now, there are lots of good reasons to be on the live stream. We're committed to providing this way for you to participate in church. Listen, if you're sick or if you're living further away or you're, you had to work or, or weather keeps you away, that's great. We're glad you have this. But if you're using this as an excuse to avoid this, that's a problem. We need to be together in worship. This is one of the disciplines that helps us be obedient and fight this spiritual warfare. We're in the midst of a battle when we're worshiping Christ. We're lobbing shells 
into his front lines when we sing the praises of our God. The discipline of being in community, the discipline of being in a small group, not living the Christian life all on our own in isolation, but like, and not just in the large group like this, but getting with 8, 10, 12 other people on a regular basis to talk about the Word of God and pray together and do life together and encourage one another, spur one another on to live this Christian life. The discipline of service, of, of, of serving others, and it's just so hard to sin when you're serving Jesus, when you're serving other people. It's just so hard to sin when you're serving. The discipline of prayer, the discipline of witness. You know, just saying, it's just not that complicated. Focus on Christ. Focus on his church. And we do so knowing, here's the second responsibility, knowing that the enemy is formidable. We have a very powerful enemy that we're coming up against. And no one should take Satan lightly. Notice this, a second sign appeared in heaven, verse 3, a great red dragon with, I mean, I can't even make heads or tails of this, seven heads and ten horns. Does that mean that each head had one horn and, and how many, and then three of the heads had two horns and like, what does this mean? Like how, I can't even, I'm trying to understand this and get a mental picture of it. And I'm sure some people have tried to draw this, but where do you put the horns on the heads? And then the heads all have crowns on them. I don't even know how the crowns work with the horns. Impossible to imagine this description of the dragon. And rather than trying to form that mental image, it's just meant to overwhelm us with, because all of these images, crowns and heads and, and horns are all pointing to his authority. All, all pointing to his power on earth. So we should simply be stunned by the great power that Satan does possess. He is, as, as Paul describes him in, in uh, 1, 1 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul describes him as the God of this age. That's the level of power that he has. Small g, God of this age. So we're not going to take him lightly. He's been granted tremendous liberties by God. To influence, to, to lead away humanity. To, to attempt to disrupt all of God's plans, to disrupt God's church. And in fact, John sees the extent of this power in, in verse 4. His tail, this dragon, his tail swept away, we have this image, swept down a third of the stars of heaven. The stars of heaven are angels. Swept away a third of them and cast them down to the earth. If you're taking notes, just jot down the reference, Daniel 8.10, because in Daniel, you, you read a very similar description. In fact, Revelation is filled with hundreds of Old Testament allusions and quotes. We can't talk about them all here, but we have the same kind of thing happening in Daniel 8. And listen, his ability to do this, this dragon, whatever this depicts, demonstrates his formidable power. And in fact, the picture that we have here of these, this third of angels being swept out of heaven and the dragon being cast out, this is a reference to the original, uh, the original fall of Satan out of heaven. He was a created angel of God, uh, meant to do God's bidding. These angels were all created as messengers of God. Satan rebelled against that and a third of the angels with him. And this is where we read of this. This alludes to the very dawn of time to the dragon being, being cast to earth. And, and, and John says, as a result of that happening, verse 7, war arose in heaven. And then, and then we, we hear about Michael. Michael is one of two archangels of God who are mentioned in the scriptures by name. We see Michael also in the book of Jude contending with uh, Satan for the body of Moses. And we see him in, in the book of Daniel, and he is, he is considered the protector of the nation of Israel their guardian angel, if, if you will. And, and God sends Michael here. It's very interesting that God sends Michael to fight out this battle. And, what, and, and one commentator said, you know, part of the reason why he does this is, is because God wants to demonstrate that Satan is not his peer. It, it's, this is not an equal battle between good and evil. There's no yin and yang going on here. God is God and Satan is somewhere down here and Michael's more powerful than him. And God's like, I can't even bother to deal with Satan. I'm sending Michael. 
And Michael can more than take care of him. Please don't ever think that this is an epic battle between peers. Satan is nowhere near God's level of power in the world. And so here's Michael and his angels. He's got a posse fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his posse, the angels, they fought back. This is verse 7. And this is the unseen battle that we're talking about here. And while we're attempting to live out our Christian lives in faithfulness to God, and often facing a hard time of it, a parallel spiritual battle is taking place in the unseen realm that is influencing what's going on here on earth. The two, the unseen battle and the battles you and I are facing are linked. Now notice what's said about this battle, verse 12, partway through, but woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath. So he's been cast out of heaven. He's out of heaven, but where is he going to go? He's going to go to earth. He can't get at the sun, so he's going to go after the woman. Woe to you, earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath. One commentator said that he's coming down in a frenzy of anger. We might call it a hissy fit. He's, come to, he's having a hissy fit on earth because he's been kicked out of heaven. He's enraged at being cast out of what he considered to be his home. He goes on this violent rampage and he's striking whomever is within reach. Now, let me just ask you a question, a little survey this morning. How many people are within the reach of Satan? Just raise your hand if you're within the reach of Satan. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. We're all within the reach of Satan. We're all vulnerable to his attack, his attacks. Why, why the outburst? Why is he so angry? Well, the verse tells us, verse 12, because he knows that his time is short. I mean, this could be a reference to the 1260 days. It could be a reference to, to just the, the brevity of, of earth history itself in the grand scheme of things, thinking about all of eternity. Earth history is like just a blip. Think about that now in terms of your microscopic little, you know, 70, 80, 90 year old life. Blip, blip. We think it's so much, it's not much. So he's mad. He's mad because his time is short. He's not going to get to carry this on for eternity. The devil only has so much time to mess with humanity and to undermine God's plan, and he intends, in that short period of time, he intends to wreak havoc on earth and in your life. And he's working overtime in some of your lives. You would say right now, this message is for me. He's working overtime in my life right now. So don't dismiss this. Don't think it's nothing. Satan is formidable. He wants you to think it's nothing. In fact, um, this great quote from Charles Baudelaire, he said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. He does exist. He's a force. Verse 17. So the dragon became furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. So initially he's mad because the child gets pulled away. But now the offspring, who, who are the offspring of the people of God that gave birth to, to, to the Messiah, to the son? We are. It, that's our generations, all the ones after the coming of Messiah were the ones who are now in the crosshairs of Satan. He went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. How's he doing that? Subverting doctrine, so much confusion about what the word of God actually teaches, people believing the, the, the weirdest nonsense about how to be saved, how to have a relationship with God people trapped in legalism, so many, so many distortions of the true and genuine gospel. He's messing with us. He's making war on, on the woman's offspring, on the church, on the people of God by allowing abuse to happen in the church. By allowing, by, by allowing toxic leadership to rise up and to hurt many. He, he, he brings it about in the church by, by, 
by allowing gossip and slander, causing gossip and slander to happen between people and in a thousand other ways. He went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those, who's he talking about? On those who keep his commandments, those who keep the commandments of God. That's us. We're just trying to keep the commandments. We're just trying to live holy lives. That's what he means by that. We're just trying to live and be like Jesus and who hold the testimony of Jesus. That's the mission that we've been entrusted with to tell people the gospel. And so this is you and me. Satan has, has, has us again in his crosshairs and, and he stood, the, 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 the chapter ends with, with this, he stood on the sand of the sea. He's, he's in his power stance. And in chapter 13, he's about to summon the beast out of the water in order to carry out his destructive plans. This enemy is formidable and we should take nothing of what the devil does in a casual or flippant way. His attacks, both overt and covert, must be addressed decisively. Now, having said all of this, um, there's a danger. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of dangers and I want to bring a warning and it comes from C.S. Lewis, in fact. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, and he's speaking about the human race or Christians, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. So that's the Baudelaire quote. Satan loves it when you don't believe in him. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. To be obsessed by the devils, to be obsessed by demonology, by Satan. And they themselves, the devils, are equally pleased by both. They're fine if you believe they don't exist, and they're fine if you obsess with them, and we must do neither. The focus, as we saw, is to be on Christ and his church. We're recognizing how formidable he is, but we're not focusing on him at all. Because we know this, and see this last point. He has already been soundly defeated. Amen? He's already been soundly defeated. John saw this. Verse 8, this battle starts, Michael's engaged, his angels, the, the dragon and his angels, but he was defeated. And the defeat meant that there was no longer a place for them in heaven, verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down. Jesus said in Luke's gospel, he said in, in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil. And you, you see all these, all these names and designations for him start to come out. That ancient serpent is called the devil. That's the word adversary, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. Verse 10 later is going to add the accusers, accuser of the brothers. All the titles, just so we're absolutely clear who we're talking about. Verse 9, he was thrown down to earth and his angels, the demons, were thrown down with him. He's done. He knows he's done. He knows he's beaten. He knows he's defeated. But then John hears this lone and very loud voice in heaven, verse 10, saying, and again, I just want to keep coming back to it. The focus is on Jesus. And this lone, loud voice makes that point. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser, Satan, the devil, has been thrown down. And he says this, who accuses them, who accuses the brothers and sisters, accuses the church, the believers, day and night before our God. He's been thrown down in the sense that his home is no longer in heaven. He no longer belongs there. And yet he still has access, it's pretty clear, he still has access to the throne room of God because he's still there before the Lord accusing you and me. This is a a picture of what happened in Job chapter one with Job, where Satan goes before God and he accuses Job. And Job wasn't the only one. Revelation 12 tells us that's, his full, that's Satan's full-time job. Okay, he's got the world system, which is, is, serves a really good purpose in leading people into all kinds of evil. 
He's got his demons who, who knows how many of them there are. They're all over the world. They're messing with people all the time. But Satan's full-time job is in the throne room of God. He doesn't belong there. He's been cast out, but he's there before God saying, you know what? Look at Todd. That guy's a mess. Look what he's doing. Look what he's thinking. Look what he just said. Just accusing me, accusing me, and he's accusing you, and that's what Satan is doing. But here's how that decisive, but he's beaten. This is, this is all desperate on his part. But here's how that decisive victory came about, verse 11. For they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Speaking of the believers, believers conquer by the blood of the Lamb. They beat Satan by the blood of the Lamb by the word of their testimony, by the mission that they're on, by the, by the transforming story of salvation in their lives, by not cherishing their own lives. They loved not their own lives even, even to, unto death. And from verse 11, there's no mistaking that the victory is gained one way only. It isn't it isn't Michael that beats them ultimately. It, 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 isn't, it isn't the woman or the church, the believers and their their power, their engagement in, in ministry. It's not Christians getting it done. The one and only way that Satan is defeated, notice it there in the verse, is by the blood of the lamb. It's the blood of the lamb that has beat Satan. The sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross is the power behind the dragon's defeat. That he was resurrected from the dead releases that power into all who believe including you and me. And in that way, God ordains this divine human cooperative. So yes, he's using his holy angels. Yes, he's using his church, the woman. He's using the believers. As we imitate Christ, as we model the sacrifice that Jesus made, the word of our testimony is also then given credit for overthrowing Satan. That testimony, of course, is the evidence that we give that the blood of the Lamb saved us, that we are His witnesses, that we're willing to go as far as Jesus did in our devotion to the gospel mission. The brothers and sisters here loved not their lives even unto death, and that echoes what Jesus said the Christian life is supposed to be all about. It's this death to self. He said in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, take up his or her method of execution, take up whichever method of execution you want to take up, but you need to be dead to self if you're going to follow Jesus. Take up his cross and follow me, Jesus said, for whoever would save his life will lose it. If you're about your life, if you're about building your wealth, uh, uh, preserving your uh, comfort, preserving your security, if you're all about you, if you have no room for Jesus, if that's what your life is about, listen, you will lose it. Not my words. Jesus' words. But whoever loses his life for my sake, whoever gives it up, will save it. And so listen, we don't defeat Satan in any other way but by the blood of the Lamb. We don't defeat Satan by, by engaging in a culture war to change laws and to make our country more Christian. We're, we're not going to defeat Satan by living these prosperous, comfortable, healthy lives, citing the blessings on, of God on us as Christians. We, we don't defeat Satan by preserving our physical lives at all costs. We don't defeat Satan with nice church buildings, with, with full ministry calendars and programming, with growing budgets and growing giving and growing staff and growing membership. None of these things defeat Satan. The blood of the Lamb blood of the lamb because victory over the evil one is spiritual in nature 
It's not something we see. It's seen in faithfulness to the mission and proclaiming the testimony that we have about Christ. It's measured in faith and perseverance and not in attendance figures. And so with that in mind, the call goes out to all who believe. Verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. This should be such an encouraging message. I get sometimes when we look at the book of Revelation, and we see a book of judgment. That's like a word that often comes to mind. Book of Revelation, and all these judgments. Look what God's going to do. He's going to take care of business. We think first of the judgment of the book of Revelation. But in reality, what we've been seeing in all of these messages, we're in message 19 of 33 as we were. We're past the halfway point of the book itself. And over and over again, what we're seeing is God delaying and God pausing and God giving another opportunity and God once again proclaiming his message, wanting more people. Revelation isn't a book of judgment. It's a book of mercy. In fact, Dustin Benji said this in the book of Revelation, and this might be shocking to some of us when we think about it. It was shocking to me when I saw it. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is titled Lion only one time. We think of him coming as the lion. He's going to come. He's going to conquer. One time. And lamb, 29 times. We miss something of the the sweetness and tenderness and loveliness of Jesus when we don't recognize that he is inclined more toward mercy than judgment. So the message of Revelation 12 of this incredible chapter is that Satan has been defeated and we need to get this message to as many people as we can possibly get it to. People who are in need of the mercy of God. people who are struggling with the, with the difficulty of life in all of its forms, for whom the spiritual war is raging behind the scenes and manifesting itself in their lives. People who you know at work and in your neighborhoods and in your own families, whose marriages are crashing and who need the hope of Jesus Christ. They need the blood of Jesus Christ on their marriage. People gripped by addictions, addictions that can be overcome because of the blood of the lamb who was slain. People crushed by anxiety and depression who can be healed or who at the very least can receive the grace of God to manage that every day. People who are grieving. People who are managing anger blood of the lamb can be applied to all of this. People, listen, the blood of the lamb ensures that we can control ourselves sexually. We don't need to be given over to the temptations of this world. There's hope for all of this and so much more in Jesus Christ. Satan has been soundly defeated. That battle is done. We need to celebrate that defeat and the beauty of what Jesus Christ offers us even while the war continues to rage around us and even in us. Amen? Let me pray for us. Our God and Father, I I would pray um, thanking you, first of all, for your word, for the vibrancy of of the images that we've worked through here today. Thank you for providing this revelation to John and and giving it to us as your church for encouraging us like this. And Father, we we want to lean hard into your mercy right now and to think about the Lamb of God and to think about all of those in our lives who desperately need this. But first, Father, even as believers, we struggle with this. We give in to temptation. We lose the the, the little skirmishes and and the small battles that take place. Father, help us to never forget that by the blood of the Lamb, Satan has been defeated. And we can live a victorious, holy life, obedient to you, believing the truths of your word, not deceived in the least. 
So God, help us with that and then send us on mission to to speak the testimony of Jesus Christ out from our own lives. There are thousands, tens of thousands of people within a 30-minute drive of this place that are in the grip of Satan right now. They need you. And we have this message of mercy for them. So God, give us opportunity, give us courage to speak when we need to. Thank you for providing us again with this word today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.